Our gospel today comes from the Gospel of Mark, the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. After Jesus and his disciples left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon Peter and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told Jesus about her at once. He came and took her by hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And Jesus would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got out and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, let us go on to the neighboring town so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went through Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of all our hearts, in every action of all our lives, be always acceptable to you, Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, my wife Shirley gets annoyed at me over many things, <laughs> but the one that applies particularly today to what we've been reading is my tendency to look at a TV show or a movie and, and pay attention to the people in the background. Not, not the stars, not those that seem to be in charge, but the ones in the background. And in today's scripture, we, we see how important that is because just like in the TV shows, it's the scripture, it's the people in the background who make a difference. I mean, it, it's not true in the first part of the story. I mean, Simon Peter's mother-in-law is definitely um, an important character. She, in our movies, probably call her supporting character, but she's still important. Jesus style is the star, but she's important. And we see that happen, but then we move on to the next passage. And this is the part of the passage that really struck me today. It's the part where we begin to talk about the crowd. You see, this, this group of people, this crowd of unnamed, uncounted, almost unnoticed people, they are what matters. They are really the key. I mean, yes, Jesus is a star, but without the crowd, look what happens. He shows up at Simon Peter's house, he cures the woman, and he has the rest of the night off. Nothing important happens without the crowd. Now, there are a couple things about that crowd. Peter, I mean, I'm sorry, Mark makes the point of saying that they came after sunset. Now, this is important because, remember, they had been in the synagogue with Jesus, so it's the Sabbath. And the Sabbath ends at sunset. So Mark is going out of his way to explain that they are not breaking Sabbath rules or asking Jesus to break Sabbath rules. But more importantly, take a step back and think about the crowd and their actions. I mean... They had heard Jesus speak. They declared he spoke as one with authority. They saw him drive out evil spirits. And now just a, a few hours later, as soon as it was possible for them to do so, they, they gather up all the ill or possessed by evil spirits in the town. It says everyone in the town was at the door. And they bring them to Jesus. Now, at, at this point, I would cause my professors to, to tear the, the hair right out of their heads because what I'm about to say is not explicitly mentioned in Scripture, but I think we can be 100% certain that these people had tried everything they knew about to try to heal their loved ones. They'd used every method in their tradition. They had brought their loved ones to the priest. They had done everything but healing hadn't happened. So they went looking for another leader, another healer. Now, I won't go quite so far as to say they came to Jesus out of desperation, although 
I, I personally would guess they did, or at least some did. I mean, if your loved one had been possessed or ill for many years and nothing you did would help them, would you not be desperate to try something else? As always, the question then becomes, what are the implications for us in this life? And I think they're very strong. Now, just like last week, let me say this is not about politics. It is not directed at any one group. All the political sides, and there are actually several, can be seen in these actions. It's not about politics. It's about behaving as Christians and specifically Christian leaders. You see, when I, when I picture the crowds running desperately to reach Jesus, I thought about the crowds today, physical or virtual, looking to this person or that person, looking desperately for good leadership. Crowds today who feel like the historical leadership has not solved the problems facing them. As I said, I'm not talking about politics because I think the issues I want to talk about go so much deeper. I'm talking about religious leadership and specifically Christian leadership. Now, I'm not looking for conformity. I believe it's possible for sincere, prayerful, spiritual, God-loving people to disagree on certain questions. No, what I wanna focus on is what Jesus said. Not what I say, not the church, but what Jesus said. Jesus says that what matters is how we treat other people. Nothing else is as important as that. In fact, I'm convinced that if you look at when Jesus said, we are to love God and love our neighbors, that a easier to understand paraphrase of that would be, we are to love God by caring for all other people, by caring for all other people. I mean, think about it. Consider how you show love to your spouse or your children or, or whomever. It's by doing something. The same goes for showing our love for God. And Jesus says that what we should be doing is treating other people well. It's not how we feel about them but how we treat them. To love our enemies does not require we like them. It requires we treat them well. Although it does also mean we don't allow ourselves to be abused. So again, what does that mean in today's world? Well, possibly my all time favorite movie is The American President. The theme on it that I wanna focus on today is when the president is running for re-election, but for a reason that doesn't matter today, is not campaigning. In fact, he's not speaking out at all. One of his advisors begins to yell at him over that and over how the opposition is the only one being heard. And this advisor says, and I'm paraphrasing, that people want leadership. And if we don't give it to them, they will go to that other person. People are so desperate for leadership, he says, they will crawl through the desert toward a mirage, drinking the sand and hoping of finding it. Well, the president pauses for a moment, looks at him and says, people don't drink the sand because they are thirsty. They drink the sand because they don't know the difference. Now, my suspicion is that most of us at this point are thinking, oh, how true, how true. Those, those other people don't know the difference between real leadership and the person they voted for. Well, that's not my point. <laughs> as, my, as I said, my point is not to pick on one person and not the other. Rather, it's the exact opposite. See, my point is, that, is if we Google Christian beliefs or Christian values or just look on the news, we can find lots of people who claim to be Christian leaders, but who are demonstrating a deep personal lack 
of care for all people. They care maybe for the people that agree, they agree with, but they don't care and in fact attack many other people. Now, a couple days ago on Thursday, this sermon got completely rewritten because I was told about the perfect example of Christian love being challenged. A friend of mine saw what was literally a random post on Facebook from a woman who said she was a she was suffering from kidney failure. All of her obvious donors were not good matches, and she was about to die. So in desperation, she was reaching out, hoping beyond hope that this healing could occur. Now, my friend assumed it was a scam. At least that's certainly what I would have assumed. But pretty much on a lark, she called the medical office, mentioned in the, in the post and found out this woman was on the up and up. It was true. So my friend said to herself, well, maybe, maybe God's calling me to check this. And so she had herself tested and it turns out she's a perfect match. Isn't that a great story? Well, it gets better. See, in, at, until she was actually tested and there's some testing still to go on. So we aren't sure it'll work, but until she was tested, she had talked to a woman a couple times, but only about medical issues, nothing else. So she said, I, I want to know this person. The person is getting my kidney. I want to know them a little bit. So she checked into her Facebook website, to her Facebook um, profile, and discovered this woman who was asking for her kidney was a rabid, rabid supporter of the other political party. Her posts are nasty, mean, insulting of anyone who disagrees with her. In other words, there's not a single sign of Christian love in anything she writes. What would you do? Would you give an important part of your own body to a person who, by extension, has called you every insulting name in the book. Think about the person you hate the most. Would you give them a kidney to save your life? Save their life? What would you do? Honestly. And once you've answered that question for yourself, step away from it for a moment and ask, what would be the loving, caring for your enemies action be? Now, I confess, donating that kidney would be very difficult for me to decide to do to a person who had treated me that way. Well, I think that situation in our world is similar to the situation faced by the crowd. I believe we see many people seeking desperately desperately for leadership and more specifically Christian leadership as shown by Christian love. So I invite you, consider what your actions you can do that might show Christian love and specifically Christian love to someone who hates you. Someone you probably don't like a whole lot better. Now, be aware, they almost certainly will not change. It is not about what they do. It's about what we do. The individual may not change, but I have no doubt that if we were to show true Christian leadership, true Christian love, the world would get better. So what can you do this week? Now, it may not be with words, but how can you show Christian love and show it with authority? Amen.